Welcome to the third example from section 2.7, the falling objects examples in chapter 2. In this example, we are standing at the top of a tall building when we choose to throw a ball upwards. It makes this problem different than the previous one that we've seen, and in the following example, we will be throwing a ball downwards, and we'll see the differences in how we set these two examples up. Well, let's stick with this one for now. So we've got our problem solving process for part A. The very first thing we do is we draw a picture. So here is our building. We are here at the top and the ball is here at the top. I'm always going to draw baseballs. And we throw it upwards. The initial velocity that we give it is upwards. Gravity is always working against us though. And this height of the building that we're told is 25 meters. All right, so step two is when we really kind of label and list all of the given information so that it's easier for us to pay attention to. The initial velocity is upwards, which means positive, 20 meters per second. And we are standing far above the ground and in fact, 25 meters above the ground. And because we're here on Earth in a falling objects problem, gravity, the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, so in part A, we wanna rephrase the question because that's a skill we've been building this whole time. We wanna find something when something else is true. Now this is in fact the same question from the previous example, part A. We are trying to find t when y equals zero. So we're gonna see in just a bit why the problem is slightly different now than it was before. We still are gonna use the yt equation because that's what these blanks are suggesting we use. We filled in the blanks with the letters y and t, and so that tells us to use the yt equation. So step four is always to write down the equation before we plug in numbers. All right, so we write it all out. And then step five is when we start to plug in numbers. All right. So the final y is 0 because that's where the ground is. The initial y is 25 because that's where we started. We threw it upwards, so this is a positive 20 that's attached to t. Now we have 1 half times negative 9.8 times t squared. All right, now one thing I really want to point out to us is what we have on the screen or on your page so far this is all of the physics. This is the new skills that we're building here. Figuring out how to analyze a situation in a way that allows us to use the tools that we have available to us to deal with that situation. Now, for the first time in this problem, we have to add an extra step of math that is essential to our problem solving in situations like these. In order to solve this problem, it is not solvable without the quadratic formula. We need to use the quadratic formula. The two answers we're going to get mathematically are messy enough that we would not be able to factor this. Now, if we look at this, we can rewrite this so it looks closer to the quadratic formula expectations. So first of all, the part that has t squared is negative 4.9 t squared. So I'm gonna highlight that in, so it's this section here, okay? It's just the first one that I've drawn here. I haven't changed anything except I've multiplied 1 half times negative 9.8. Then I'll add 20 t, because that's also on the problem. Right, I haven't done anything else though. I've just written it down in a slightly different order to where it was before. 
and then I'm going to add the 25 that's still there. And that equals 0, no matter if we write that equals 0 on the left or on the right. So it's plus 25 is here, the same as it was. Now the quadratic formula is a t squared plus b t plus c equals zero. That's the time when we will use the quadratic formula. That's when it becomes essential. Because the quadratic formula itself is, this is how we solve for t. t is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, and then that entire thing is over 2a. So to be clear, these letters a, b, and c represent the constants. They aren't a for acceleration or anything else. They are just constants. In this case, a is negative 4.9, B is positive 20, and C is positive 25. So all of that will go into the quadratic formula. So I'm going to scroll down to give us space to complete that. All right, so when we plug these in, we get that T is equal to negative 20, plus or minus the square root of 20 squared minus 4 times negative 4.9 times 25. All of that is under the square root. And then this entire thing is all over 2 times negative 4.9. Okay, so let's simplify this a little bit. We've got negative 20 plus or minus, on the bottom we have negative 9.8, and then the square root and all of this I'm going to do in a single step on my calculator. And what I want you to do is just take as many steps as you need to and then just make sure that your result matches mine. So I'm taking the thing under the square root getting all of that, and then taking the square root of that total. All right, so let me just make sure we know what I'm typing in to my calculator here. All of that becomes 29.8. All right, so for this t value then, we have two possibilities. We have the positive number and the negative number. If we choose to add so we take negative 20 plus 29.8, that gives us positive 9.8, divided by negative 9.8, one of these options that math tells us is negative 1.0 seconds. That's the negative, that's adding it. If instead we take the negative, negative 20 minus 29.8, now we have negative 49.8, divided by negative 9.8 gives us a positive, t equals a positive 5.1 seconds, or 5.08. In physics, we do not have time travel. There will be lots and lots of situations when we use the quadratic formula where one is my negative and one is positive. This is not always the case, but often it is, and we need to recognize what we're able to figure out from the situation that tells us what answer it is. And if one is negative and one is positive, then it's an easy answer. It's the one that is positive. So we need the positive time. And step six of does it make sense? First of all, our does it make sense is we need to have positive time. There's no time travel. And five seconds seems pretty reasonable because we are on the top of a building and we threw the ball upwards and it's got to come all the way down to the bottom of the building. And so several seconds to go through all of that seems reasonable, especially compared to our much faster throw in the previous problem. 
that was also about five seconds. And we weren't even standing on top of a roof at that point. All right, so part A is finished. The trick, I suppose, the trick in part A is just the fact that we had to use the quadratic formula. We will get more comfortable with this as we go along. And I do want to point out that if on your calculator you have something that does the quadratic formula, oftentimes it's called quad form, something similar, that is allowable when you are submitting assignments where we need to see your work to give full credit. But what we ask is that you actually write out what you're typing into your calculator when you tell it what A is, when you tell it what B is, and when you tell it what C is. Because that's where the mistake often happens that is a big physics mistake that just kind of gets swept under the rug if we never get to see where your pluses and minuses actually go for problems like these. All right, so let's move on to part B. For part B, the maximum height, this is a new phrase that we are seeing in this example problem for the first time, but it is definitely not the last time we will see it. So our problem solving process, it is worth redrawing just to make sure we know what's going on. We're throwing the ball upwards. And so at some point it will reach a maximum height before it starts to come back down again. The information given to us in the problem, that initial velocity is positive 20 meters per second. The initial height is 25 meters above the ground. And acceleration is always working against us, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, this is where we really need to recognize something important here. Maximum height is always rephrased in the same way. And if we don't understand why it's rephrased like this, then our minds won't remember it when we need it on a homework or quiz or test. We need to find the height, right? That, that part shouldn't be tricky. We're finding the height, but the reason why it's a maximum height is because momentarily we have stopped moving at that point. With vertical motion, it is the full velocity is zero. Eventually this will be Vy equals zero when we're talking about it in chapter two. But the maximum height is always, always rephrased like this. Because if the ball is still moving, if it's got a positive velocity, it will be moving higher than whatever height you've just tried to find. If it has a negative velocity, then it was higher previous to the height which you have just tried to find. So we're finding the brief moment in time where it stops moving. If you've got anything around you that you can throw upwards and then catch again, do that and look at what it does at the very top of its motion. It briefly stops moving so that it can change direction and come back down to your hand. All right, so as always, when we phrase these questions, we do so to tell ourselves what equation to use. So the VY equation. If we skip these steps, then it really is easy for us to tell ourselves, I don't know what equation to use if we haven't trained ourselves to go through this problem solving technique. You never want to make your life harder than it has to. Going through this setup is not wasted time. It means you won't get stuck just staring at your page not knowing what to do. It's always, always progress. Okay, so the VY equation we can write down. So we'll write it out. And then only after we've already written it out will we plug in numbers. So that final velocity is zero by definition of what we mean by peak height or maximum height. The initial velocity was 20, that gets squared. Two times negative 9.8 times y minus our initial starting point of 25. All right, so let's simplify this a bit. We have 400 and we have this two times negative 9.8 times y, so that's minus 19.6y. And then, basically we're having to distribute all this. We also need to have two times negative 9.8 times negative 25. And that's going to end up being positive 490. 
Okay, I'm going to add 19.6y to both sides. So we have 19.6y equals 890. If we divide 19.6 now to get y all by itself, then we have that y is equal to 890 divided by 19.6 which is equal to 45.4 meters. Now, this is a really good chance to see if this makes sense. There is a really, really clear check that we should do for ourselves on whether that answer makes sense to us. What do we know has to be true about this number value? Besides it being a positive or negative number, it's a positive number, but what else do we know has to be true about the number itself? Pause the video and think through it if you're uh, not immediately thinking of something um, off the top of your head. Looking back at the picture will help. Okay. Hopefully we said to ourselves that that maximum height has to be bigger than our starting point. It has to be bigger than 25 meters because we started at the top of a building and threw it upwards. It's going to go further above the ground than where we started. Often I will see people go through this in their heads and then if their number was smaller for some reason, usually a math error, they'll just add 25 to it and hope that it fixes the problem. That's basically sweeping the issue under the rug. Those checks are telling us Something is wrong in the problem and we want to find them. We don't want to ignore those issues and just hope they go away. So this is the first time we've seen maximum height. Make sure that you have a sense of why we had to rephrase the question the way that we did. That's always going to be the way that the maximum height question gets rephrased. Uh, I will note that in chapter three, when that happens, we'll be talking about specifically the why part of the velocity, but that's for another chapter. And so we've still got a couple more examples here in chapter two to deal with, so I will talk to you in those.